happy Saturday morning. What do you know? It's another episode of Collider Mailbag. I'm your host, John Roca. Very, very excited and thankful that you've taken the time to watch this episode today on a lovely Saturday morning or afternoon or evening, depending on when you're watching this. Hope you're having a good time there in your life. We're going to give you 30 minutes of good times from our life here on the Collider Mailbag set. I'm joined today by author, writer, uh, Schmodown champion, master of all things cinema, and one of the best dudes I've ever met in this sphere, and a guy I come back to all the time because I love his takes on everything. Uh, my man, Mark Andre how are you, man? Wow, you be my hype man. <laughs> wow, <laughs> gladly. I, I, I don't feel worthy. Well, thank you very much. I love doing this. I love. I love. This is a way to connect with the fans. Yeah. And sometimes they ask insightful questions that we don't get a chance to talk about when we're doing the the big headline stuff. So this is always a blast. So thank absolutely. you for having me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for. Coming on, and yeah, the fans send in the questions. You know, when we put those calls out on social media, remember to put that hashtag Collider Mailbag there when we do it on Twitter and on Instagram. Makes it easier for me to find and possibly get it picked for the show. If you don't want to do social media, you can also email us at mailbag at collider.com. That's mailbag at collider.com. I pour through all of those, pick out some questions, and we answer them here on the show. Are you ready? I am ready to go. <laughs> all right, let's jump into it. Our first question, it's a Twitter question. It's from at Jay Carping About. They ask, uh, why doesn't Daisy Ridley have a bigger post-Force Awakens career? Is she being typecast, or is she just picky with her non-Star Wars parts? Mark? Um, that's, a, that's just a, a, a the fates. You know, that's like saying, why didn't why didn't Mark Hamill have a bigger career? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes the fates conspire. That. And we see here, you know, the list of the movies that she's done and Murder on the Orient Express. She's yep. got a big name in it. There's all those other stars. Right. Peter Rabbit's a... Yeah, just a voice over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Doug Lyman's Chaos Walking, I think, is going to premiere on a plane next year. <laughs> uh, and A Woman of No Importance. Great performances in there, but they're not big breakthrough movies. Right. And... How much of her time was booked making these movies? These movies take a long time to mm -hmm. make. So I think her first movie post Last uh, Rise of Skywalker will be interesting. I think yeah. I think she has the goods. It's just finding the right project to something different. Yeah, I also think here. I mean, remember that when she came, when she got the Star Wars job, she had done six episodes of separate TV shows in Britain. So it mm -hmm. wasn't like she'd come in with all this pedigree and all this other work. Mm -hmm. So she understood how to navigate the situation. I think for her, this is a, a thing that consumes an incredible amount of her time. She is the lead. It isn't like uh, Boyega or, or or Oscar Isaac. She is the lead. Her and, Con and and Driver are the lead. Driver, I think, had already had more experience navigating the, the uh, film world and figuring out how to balance his time with the film. I think Daisy just understands this is where she's at. She's still young. And so once this is done, then we'll start to see what she can do and where she wants to go. And maybe she's one of these people that doesn't need to work all the time. Yeah, and this will also, being in the Star Wars movies will allow her to open the doors for other choices and we'll get to see yeah. what her personality is. By casting an unknown in these movies, it allows us to bring our stuff, our own stuff to the Star Wars movies. Right. I get why they cast an unknown. But I think it'll be interesting to see what she does after this, because I'm sure it's a big relief to be done. I mean, it's a great opportunity, but making those big movies has got to be exhausting. Yeah. And Star Wars fans. <laughs> yeah, right. You exactly. There, you're, certainly, there, some members of the fandom have been typical yes, for him. Some. Yeah, yeah, right. The, the loudest ones are the least pleasant, and exactly. that's got to be tough for her. Yeah, exactly. And we've seen her move off of social media, so maybe putting this behind her and moving on, we'll start to see more and more interesting choices. Because yeah. the choices she has made, she has done well in them. I enjoyed her Mur Murder on the Orient Express and in oh, Peter I Rabbit. Yeah, I wasn't insulting those no, no, things, no, but, they're, but they're not star-making performances. Right, they're not. She's got the goods. Ultimately, she will work for the rest of her life. Whether yeah. she becomes a superstar or not is out of everyone's control right. but I think she's a solid actress and I am interested to see her in other things yeah yeah agreed alright our second uh, question it's another Twitter question you want to read this one Mark uh, okay oh, you want me to do it no, I'll, I'll, do no it. I'll read it I'll read it I'm just <laughs> reading it on my with Warner Brothers remaking Sam Peckinpah's classic The Wild Bunch with Mel Gibson attached to direct uh, if you could remake any western what western would you remake I would remake The Professionals, 1966, or Broken Arrow, 1950. Thank you, Outlaw and Guest. And that was from Jay McDonald, 5150. Yeah, well, Jay, um, I will say this. Uh, let me answer first, of course, because I'm the Outlaw, damn it. Uh, Ride the High Country is one of these uh, Sam Peckinpah films that no one kind of talks about. Uh, it's almost like Kubrick's Paths of Glory. It kind of gets lost in the mix of his other more grandiose films. But Ride the High Country is a fantastic film that is two aging gunslingers uh, going against one of their own, one 
one last time to protect the shipment of gold. Uh, Randolph Scott, it was one of Randolph Scott's last films. Mm -hmm. So to me, I would love it if you could bring Gene Hackman out of retirement, pair him with Clint Eastwood this time together on the same side of a situation and have them go against uh, a, an older friend of theirs, uh, a villain, maybe Robert Duvall or somebody of that nature who has a Western pedigree to them. Uh, and they end up you know, doing what they do in the movie. I'd love to see a remake of that. Uh, and the other one is Once Upon a Time in the West, one of my favorite Sergio Leone films. Another film that also gets lost kind of in the conversation because you focus on his Man With No Name trilogy. This film is fantastic. It just recently got remastered, Charles Bronson. Mm -hmm. Henry Fonda doing one of the only times he's ever played a villain. Those crystal blue eyes being used for evil. Fantastic in the film. I think it'd be interesting to see Daniel Day-Lewis take on that part and maybe uh, Tom Hardy play the harmonica part, which is the Charles Bronson part. How about uh, Ian McKellen playing the other gunslinger? Oh, oh, as the aging gunslinger right the high country? That would be awesome. I, yeah, just the three of them acting. Yeah. They, could, they could floss their teeth for three hours. And Absolutely. Watch um, first, I want to say I don't need Mel Gibson to remake The Wild Bunch. Yeah, um, we'll see. I didn't like the Magnificent Seven remake no, at all. I think Mel Gibson's a decent director, yes. but I think I know exactly what a Mel Gibson Wild Bunch looks like. Yeah, There's, a lot of blood. I, yeah, um, I would pick is the two movies. I would pick um, Stagecoach okay. as a remake because I think that's Fury Road as a western. I think yeah. you could do you could do something where you do it all in real time and all and and have actual physical stunts because right. if the one thing that was the best thing about the Daniel Craig James Bond movies was oh my god people are going to die doing this this isn't CG right. and having that in Stagecoach and I think it's a timeless story yep. uh, and the other one would be Red River because I think Red River is such a great film yeah. and it's one of the westerns that is a character piece mm -hmm. as much as it is a shoot em up. Right. There's, and I think you would get great. If you watch the original, Montgomery Clift in that movie, that's one of his unsung performances. Mm -hmm. People forget. I would argue that's probably in his top two. I'd put that wow. up there with Judgment at Nuremberg. I think yeah. it's an amazing performance. And it's a movie that's about something as well as being incredibly entertaining. And I think both of those could be remade in today's world mm -hmm. and not diminish or feel like just copying the original. Well, you could have the father-son dynamic. You'd have the generational dynamic, oh, yeah. which happened, which is always universal in yeah. every decade. That would absolutely work. It would be fantastic to see that go down and not see it in black and white. Uh, I, I liked, I'd be interested to see how you could how you could uh, remake that movie. Uh, but I like your first choice, yeah. too. Uh, I love the idea of Stagecoast, John, get a little, uh, uh, what is this? Is it Cisco Kid? The Cisco yeah. Kid? Have him with the John Wayne part, has, seeing what you could do with that. Because people do forget about that movie. And it's the one that announced John Ford and John Wayne, their partnership together. It kind of previews it's, what's to come. And it's easy to write off John Wayne. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he, he was a good actor. Mm -hmm. um, he played a lot of personality stuff because that's what paid the bills. But there was there was actual talent there. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't disagree. Couldn't agree with you more. All right, our, our third question. It's a Twitter question from JD101. They asks, "Hello, with the success of comic book movies, why do you think the stores like Walmart refuse to sell comic books? When I was a kid growing up in the '90s, there used to be tons of them at the checkout counter. You would think the mo with the movies and toys being so profitable, you would think it would be logical to have the source material there too. Thanks and have a good weekend, Mr. Andreco. Okay. Well, first of well, Walmart does sell comic books now. DC has for over a year now been doing 100 page giants. With oh, okay. 25 with 24 pages of new story and reprints. They're five dollars for 100 pages. Wow. They're great. And now they were so successful in Walmart that they're now doing that in comic book stores. So there's this whole and and DC is doing kids books like that, Scooby Doo and Teen mm -hmm. Titans Go, as well as Batman and Swamp Thing and villains and all that stuff. And they're doing very well. Um, it's not about comic books that they are that they weren't there. That was the collapse of newsstands, right? And return. And because newsstand magazines were, if you didn't sell them, you'd strip the cover and return them. Yep. So back in the day, you could overprint stuff. Now it's just so much money. And people don't read books. I right. mean, I miss news, newsstands and bookstores. And I'm, you know, so it's just a matter of access. I've been saying for years that Marvel and DC, Warner Brothers and Disney should be doing giving free digests out at the first opening weekend with a mm -hmm. digital code mm -hmm. because a good drug dealer gives you the first hit for free <laughs> and you give a kid a digest reprinting classic Spider-Man stories and then right. they'll read them. It's just a matter of accessibility and being able to find them. So technically Walmart is doing comic books and they also sell reprint packs of Marvel stuff there as well. Right, right. Yeah, they used to, like, I think Mark makes a great point. They used to this, have the stands there. You could, I remember like I spinning got a spinner through rack them. In my yeah. room. The spinning racks were the best. Mm -hmm. You could pick out and say, oh, I didn't even know this was out. But when you'd buy it, but yeah, the, exactly what Mark said. Everything's gone digital, so it's a lot more difficult. Even comics knowledge, comics knowledge, it only exists because people wanted digital formats of these comic books they could read on their iPads or on their uh, on their computers. And we forget, of, yeah. when you live in a New York or in LA, we have tons of comic books 
stores. Right. But there are there are so many places in the middle of the country where in Montana there might not be a comic book store. Yeah. Yep. So people for digital has helped them. So once again, it's the marketplace has evolved and changed. Mm -hmm. But I do agree with the all underlying thing that people do want to read comic books. Yeah. It's just a matter about making them easily accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Not always the easy thing to do, as as Mark said. It's, it depends on place, and you, they got to show profit. And maybe in certain areas they don't show as much profit as they do in other areas. So you got to make the uh, adjustments. Yeah, because people also don't realize that in those big chains you buy the shelf space. Yeah. You're, you're actually it's like being at a farmer's market. You're renting the stall to put your stuff out there, mm -hmm. and placement is everything. So yeah. if these start to sell well, there'll be more of them, and there'll be better placement. Yeah. And the second they don't, you have to replace it with something else that yeah. does. Yeah. You got to stay alive. All right. Our next uh, question. You want to ask this one now? Sure. This is from Rocca 100. Uh, hello, John Roca, champ. Yeah. And honored guest also a champ. Um, <laughs> uh, with the release of the final episode nine trailer, I believe J.J. Abrams is one of the best filmmakers of his generation. Mm -hmm. Those shots were brilliant. Do you think he has a chance to become the third director in history to have two films that cross the $2 billion mark? Mm. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Yeah, there is. Well, the two are, of course, the Russo brothers and James Cameron. So mm -hmm. those are the people that have had two separate movies cross the $2 billion mark. I think, the, I think this entire question hinges on one thing. Is the movie great? Is the movie even very good? I think that's going to be the, the what's going to push it over the $2 billion mark. Because it's obviously, it's the end of the Skywalker show. These nine movies coming together and ending here. It's a way to say goodbye to Carrie Fisher. Yeah, it's a way to say goodbye that. to the, the Skywalker epic. Yes, yeah. exactly. So if, if, they, if they stick the landing, I think this thing does cross to billion. I think J.J. is. Yeah, I think J.J. is a very good director, technically. Mm -hmm. um, I would argue best filmmakers of his generation because I don't know what his voice is. Yeah. I mean, much like the Russo brothers with the Avengers movies, I want to see these guys make very deeply personal films because mm -hmm. they have the talent. I just, JJ at this point, with the exception of like Felicity and Lost, everything has been yeah. a remake or an adaptation. Yeah, Mission Impossible, Star Trek. I mean, even Star Super Wars. 8 is a Steven yeah. Spielberg movie. True, it's an homage, homage to Steven Spielberg. Spielberg yep. And that's not an insult or a slam to JJ, but I would like to see him, I want to see what his personal, the film, if he could make any film, what he would make. Mm -hmm. Because with, I know there's the talent there and he's got a great visual style, but I want to see something personal because I don't know what a JJ Abrams film means. Yeah, when you yeah, say yeah. When you say Spielberg or Scorsese or Coppola, you have an idea, or Tarantino, JJ Abrams means, oh, big blockbusters. Right. So lens like, flares. Lens, yeah. yeah. I would like to see <laughs> that. And I do think he's going to, I think this movie's going to cross. If this movie's yeah. in focus, it's going to make $2 million. <laughs> Great point, Mark. Great point. Uh, I, I do think he's a fantastic filmmaker, but yes, I think Mark makes a very excellent point, and I wonder what you think about that, uh, Rocco 100, because this idea that he is uh, taking over properties that have already existed and doing his and putting his voice in them, but still keeping to the tenets of and the uh, the, the uh, canon and the mythology of those properties. He doesn't have a chance to actually say what he needs to say or yeah. create something from scratch and do something like that. That yeah. would be interesting to see. Even Ryan Johnson with Knives Out is basically his yeah. approach well, and, to and, something. And before he did Star yeah, Wars, I mean, with Brick, Brick and, and Looper, Looper, those yeah, are yeah. very, you know what a Ryan Johnson movie yeah. is. It's, it's easier to rearrange someone else's furniture than to rearrange furniture in your own house. Or even pick it out. Or even pick it out. Right, right. Yes. So I would, once again, let's see JJ. I don't need, it doesn't need to be a $2 movie about, you right. know, alpaca nuns in the Himalayas. I just want to see something that this deeply resonates with him as a person. Yeah, and, and it's a great point, Rhea, because like, uh, this is not a criticism. This is more a matter of like, we want to see what he can do. And he's got the power now to make whatever he wants next, especially exactly. after the Star Wars movie. He could do whatever he wants. So I would like to see something that shows me a little insight into who he is as, as an artist. Yeah. I know that sounds super pretentious, but it's true. No, I like that. Uh, all right, our last email is from Jonathan Charles. He says, hello, Roca, and esteemed guest. With Disney Plus launching soon, I was thinking back on how they acquired Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, Fox, et cetera. Clearly, they have enough content now for a streaming service, but do you think they are now done acquiring other companies, or will they buy more? Mark. They are a monolith. Mm. They are a monolith, and Hopefully, with a new administration, we will get some some of these monopolies broken up mm. because there were, Disney will have has had six movies this year that yeah, crossed yeah, yeah. the billion dollar mark, mm -hmm. and we don't, we still have Frozen two and Star Wars. Yep, it's great that people are going to movies, but when Disney and Fox were merged, Disney, Fox released thirty two movies last year. Mm -hmm. Disney is not going to absorb, it didn't absorb Fox to release 40 movies a year. Disney released seven movies last year and was right. the most successful studio. Um, I think Disney will consume until they're not allowed to anymore. And I do think that we need diversity in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I, I think that right now the film industry with studios is like our economy. There's the 1% 
and there's the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Studios don't make $25 million, $35 million movies. They'd rather make one $350 million movie based on some IP that they hope has value. Yeah. And this isn't a slam on quality. I just, you, you, you can't survive on a, a diet of just donuts. Yeah. I love donuts, but you need some <laughs> vegetables occasionally. And I just wish the marketplace was a little bit more diverse. Yeah. Well, this is an interesting question for me because um, I'm of two minds of it. I absolutely see Mark's point of view and this idea of needing the diversity. But then again, you can't argue the quality of the product that Disney has put out with a number of things. And if they lead to financial successes, then you say to yourself, well, yes, it is kind of weird, but can this be an anomaly where you have a a monolith take over a majority of things but produce quality content from the things they're taking over uh, and that be a good thing it's not about the quality of the content because the quality is there it's about the subject matter and the stories they're telling mm -hmm. we're telling stories uh, that are all reboots and reimaginings and things that are existing we're not you know it's why ironically and this sounds like I'm talking on both sides of my mouth, that yeah. the Joker could be a game changer because Joker is going to make the same amount of profit for for Warner Brothers that Avengers Endgame made for Disney. In terms the, of the, in terms of budget and actual no, in terms of actual profit. Yeah, yeah. Deadline did an article the other day saying that the Joker, if it crosses nine hundred million dollars, is going to make a four hundred and fifty million dollar profit. Right. It costs forty five million dollars, which is not small money, but mm -hmm. for a studio today, that's an art film. Mm -hmm. So I would just like to see them take some of their huge successes. I'm not saying I want Disney to make tiny right. films in Tagalog for the rest of their lives, <laughs> but I would like to see them use some of that profit for good and do some more diverse stuff and more yeah. character-based stuff. Just because I like film. I like a, a superhero movie just as much as I like Michael Haneke's films. Mm -hmm. So. They're not. It's not an either or. I would just like to see a little bit more diversity. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I, with that, I will mm -hmm. never disagree. Mm -hmm. I, and I think that's what people fear the most. And you know, to be honest with you, when you strip down Scorsese's comments, I feel like that's where he was coming from. This fear, this fear that we're losing these kind of middle of the ground, middle of the road movies in terms of budget or lower uh, uh, budgeted movies that have kind of surprised people well, at times. Where would Blair Witch Project? If obviously you'd have Blumhouse, but like if Disney had owned even more of that, where does the Blair Witch go? Where do those small Smaller films go to find. I would even go know, as far to say if Disney had control of Spider Man, Spider Man into the Spider Verse never would have been made. Ooh, that's a very great point, actually. Yeah, that's actually a thousand that's percent so, that's true. That's so outside of Disney's animation yeah. brand. And it's not that Disney isn't revolutionary, huh. but they would never have made that. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's a good it, point. It, it, it's, it's just a thing where, once again, we need more flavors. I want my film to be a salad bar. I want to sample all sorts of different things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think they can't be stopped from purchasing things as long as they can, and as long as you, they have something to support the fact that they, when they purchase things, they do bring budget to whatever they purchase, so and, and make profit. And we'll see if that continues with the Fox stuff, because obviously mm -hmm. it's way too early to judge that. Yeah. And they certainly buried everything that they, that Fox was going to release. They were the nerves about Jojo Rabbit, but Jojo Rabbit is getting fantastic reviews. They, they killed well, Mouse Guard. Yeah, they, they already spent Mouse $100 Garden. million dollars on that. Yeah, they buried uh, Dark Phoenix, and who knows what they're going to do with New Mutants. So there are. Th I think once they get their stuff going through Fox and through whatever, and maybe Fox Searchlight as well, then we'll see what their point of view is on that content and if they're going to see a profit from it. And that might incur other companies to either say yes or no about being bought. Well, and, and then look at the marketplace. I, I, don't know who, I don't know who wrote this article, what they were talking about, that if Scorsese made Taxi Driver today, it would mm. have to be Joker because you need that IP because no studio is going to greenlight an original movie about that kind of loner. That's true. You need something, you need a spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. Yeah. And it's just interesting with the marketplace. I get wanting profit, but I think we've got to get away from we need to increase our profit 100% every year. That's not sustainable. Right. Not every film is going to be a grand slam home run. Sometimes a double is good. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. A double gets you on base. Nothing wrong with that. It puts you in scoring position. All right, well, there you go. That's this episode of Collider Mailbag, I want to thank all of you so much again for taking the time to watch. Yeah, good or, questions today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Or to listen to us. It's always great. I know some of you have been saying, hey, I can't find it on podcast. And I keep saying every week, you can listen to it if you hook it into your Bluetooth and just walk around with hit play on the YouTube. And in essence, it is a podcast at that point because you're listening to it on your headphones. So please, uh, thanks so much for uh, sending in these. Please keep sending in your questions. Thanks so much for sending them. And as Mark said, they were fantastic questions to answer this week. When we put the call out on social media, on Twitter and on Instagram, put that hashtag Collider Mailbag on your question. It makes it easier for me to find and pick out to have my guests pick these questions uh, down the road. And also, if you want to email us mailbag at collider.com mailbag at collider.com uh mark thanks so much for taking the time where can people find you man uh, i'm on twitter and facebook uh i'm a lefty so if you're uh, politically not a <laughs> handed so i realize i'm an acquired taste if you're 
you don't like politics, avoid me. Um, I'm doing got a bunch of comic book projects. Yeah, what are you doing right now? Yeah. Um, I'm just finishing up my run on Supergirl. I have okay. a, I have a couple big projects in the works that will be announced when they are announced. Okay. Uh, and Schmodown, all that good stuff. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I'm around. Find him at Mark Andreco uh, with a C. That's with a C. You can follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. Thanks, Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith, rather, there in the booth. That's what I meant to say. Thank you so much, Adam. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow with another episode of Collider Mailbag, where Perry Nemiroff is coming back to the show to be my guest. I look forward to that. Talk to you soon.